Good morning, everybody. Just bear with me a second. Right, I think we're all live. It's a few minutes before 10 o'clock, but I just thought I would get it up and running. <clears throat> So yeah, I've got three minutes to go, but yeah, I thought I would uh, I would just start it up. Um, morning, everybody. Morning, Paul. I've got two computers on the go, so I can sort of see questions coming in. But yeah, we will uh, just give it another couple of minutes before we start. It's really weird when I look over at this computer, so I can... Uh, I can see it, there's like a two second delay on it, so I can see myself talking in the corner of a screen, but what I was doing here two seconds ago, it's very bizarre. <laughs> yeah, morning camera world, Kim okay, and Abby. <laughs> it's good that we have people arriving, it's, it's absolutely fantastic weather at the moment. Hope everybody has uh, been enjoying this weather. It uh, doesn't seem very British at the moment. It's fantastic. Morning, Chris. I'll just give it one more minute, and then uh, and then we shall start. Yeah, I bet agreed. I imagine plenty of people will be getting cameras out later. It's actually, it's gone a little bit cloudy here at the moment, but it's due to be uh, clear blue skies again soon. I'm just going to shut these curtains. Oh, there we go. In fact, I'm just going to flip this light on and then. Right, morning everybody. So it is 10 o'clock, so I shall start now. Um, so yeah, absolutely thanks everybody for uh, joining and thanks to uh, Camera World for uh, inviting me to talk about sort of UK wildlife photography um, and thanks to uh, Canon for, for sponsoring the event as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I put this uh, put this talk together um, and I, I've, got, I've got loads of photographs in there and we're sort of Ah, there's a few different themes in there and then sort of different um, different types of wildlife, uh, all the sort of wildlife I like to photograph in, in, in the UK. Um, and the slides I've put together, I mean, they're probably spanning, oh, probably spanning about 12 years, actually, because, you know, I've been photographing wildlife for some time. So there's, there's, certainly, some, uh, there's certainly some older images in here as well. So um, <clears throat> just to give you a bit of short history about me, um, I mean, I'm no doubt there's, there'll be some people I hear I, I, I may have met before, but I'm sure there's lots of people I haven't. Um, I, I've been doing photography for quite some time now, um, but originally for me it was it was you know I had a little bridge camera, um, and it was all about sort of climbing and holiday photos basically. So that first picture is me on the uh, the Hornley Ridge on the Matterhorn. Um, so you know just uh, whoever I'm climbing with, they tend to have a camera as well, and we just take photographs while we were climbing mountains or I did a I did a trip to South America I did a sabbatical uh, with my partner at the time and, and it was that trip that got me to buy an SLR so that bottom photograph that out of focus blue footed booby was the, uh, the the best I got of a, an amazing spectacle of seeing about 500 blue footed boobies diving into the sea um, that was the best I got and there were some people there with SLRs and bigger lenses and I saw what they got and I thought, gosh, you know, when the sabbatical's finished and I go back into my corporate job, I'm, I'm going to buy an SLR. Um, I did that. I think, I think that was 2007. And uh, I, I kept it in auto mode for, for, quite, for quite some time, as, as you do when you first buy an SLR. And then I, uh, I fell off at Brimham Rocks. 
um, and I really badly damaged my ankle, so sort of climbing was out of the equation for a few years. And, and it was that time that I learned how to use my SLR properly, basically. Um, and I, I got that into it um, because I'm a bit like that, I'm a bit obsessive. You're probably going to see that in the photographs. That I ended up leaving the corporate world in 2014. Um, and yeah, not not look back. I don't miss my um, my daily commute to Bradford City Centre to go work for uh, Morrison's head office. So one thing I haven't mentioned actually, which I should mention at the beginning in terms of housekeeping. So we've got um, we've got Krista here with us from Camera World, and she's going to be helping with the questions as they come through. But occasionally, when we have done these Facebook Live events, we do get scammers appear appearing. Um, now the reason I mention that is they, they might sort of come in and post links in the chat. Um, now if you see any links um, other than from Camera World itself, to totally ignore them. Don't 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 click on them. So yeah, just wanted to uh, just wanted to mention mention that point. So yeah, so like I said, I left the uh, the corporate world in February two thousand and fourteen, and in normal years, obviously this last year has not been quite a normal year. And um, I spend the autumn and winter time in um, in in Abisko, which is uh, the very northwest tip of Sweden, and that really is me in a in a in a frozen lake. We just cut a hole in the ice and jumped in, and and I work up there as a an aurora photography guide, so taking people out to photograph the northern lights um, and arctic landscapes. Um, we don't get people to jump in the lake like I was there. And then in the summertime, um, I spend the time in the UK or abroad if I can. Um, and I do a lot of focus on macro photography. That is my, that's my main thing. But al also general, general wildlife. And we're, we're more going to be focusing on general wildlife during this talk. Um, and I'm going to put a little disclaimer in. Uh, I always do when the videos are a little bit more instructional because there's there's often more than one way to get to the same result. You know, everybody has their own sort of techniques, um, and 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 everybody's always learning as well. Like, you know, if I look at my images and how they've changed over the year, I, I'm I'm definitely learning. I mean, we'll get to some shots later on where. I've actually started using my stacking techniques, which I originally did with macro photography, um, and I've actually started. I've actually started using that sometimes with with bird photography, um, and you know, often things are black and white. You know, I, I did a talk the other day on macro photography, and a lot of the techniques that I use most of the time there are other times when i do it totally different you know it's it's often just not as clear cut as you always do things this way um yeah you know, photography is very situational um, and, and also my way of doing things might not suit your way as well so i, I put that disclaimer in so basically i can sort of i can sort of get away with saying anything then <laughs> um, but I, I thought we'd start off with um uh, just a bit of a story really um so earlier this year in in march time I, I i lost my dog um which was a pretty heartbreaking event and i i'd sort of not gone out and done any early morning photography for quite some time because she she'd been ill for quite a period of time and i didn't want to take her out on a little rubbish walk and then come back grab my camera equipment because she knows what that means when i grab my camera equipment it means going for another walk and so after she passed, I was sort of like, right, I'm going to throw myself back back into early morning photography. Because for me, early morning is generally the time when sort of, you know, the magic things happen when, when I'm doing photography. And there was um, there was reports of, a, of a, a rare bird near me, a Slavonian grebe. And, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll put some time into photographing that Slavonian grebe and, you know, get up at sort of first light, head to the site. It's a couple of miles walk to, uh, to get there. So it's... it's in fact, it was nearly as much of a walk to get to where the bird is as it is to drive there from here. Um, and uh, any, any, it turned out to be a very, very easy bird to photograph. The first morning I went, uh, you know, here's here's some images of it. It's absolutely a stunning, stunning bird. is a Slavonian grebe. It's it was still in its winter plumage. And as I was walking back from there, I, I saw this, I saw this wren. Um, and it was absolutely singing its heart out. And it was just moving between these gorse bushes on either side of the path. Um, and as I'm watching it, and I'm sort of thinking about how loud it's it's singing, um, I'm sort of thinking, wow, I wonder if I caught this bird just as the uh, just as the sun's coming up, um, 
and I've got the sun behind it and it's a cold morning and there's there's not much wind. I was thinking, I wonder if I could sort of capture a capture a wren's breath. So I went on this mission to try and capture a wren's breath, basically. And for three weeks, I was going down there every morning that the weather forecast looked right. So what I was basically looking for was um, clearish skies in the morning. So I would catch the sun as it came over the horizon. Um, little to no wind and anything i did a bit of research basically anything colder than about four degrees and you can potentially see birds breath is the sort of the ideal conditions so i, I kept on going down i got the yeah you know, some absolutely amazing sort of misty mornings um and yeah for three weeks when i kept on going down the bird would just stay on the other side of the path so if i'm looking up the path um, the bird needed to be on the right side of the path and it, every morning I went down and it was conditions like this which is what I needed the bird was staying on the left side of the path anyway after uh, three weeks of going da down I'm not sure how many miles I, uh, I I walked to do this and I had to walk past a, a, a site where a barn, a barn owl hunts as well so I was literally having to ignore this barn owl um, which was pretty hard for me to do because I love photographing barn owls and walk down to this spot where the wren was but after yeah yeah and then if if i didn't have any joy it's a great site anyway it's also got black neck greaves and um, so i'd spend spend some time photographing them as well and then finally i managed to uh i managed to get images of a wren's breath so here were the uh here were the images um yeah, that one, that one there, when I got back home, I sort of tweeted this out, you know, managed to capture a wren's breath, etc. And it was my most successful tweet ever with a, uh, the last time I looked at it, it had 3.2 million views. So it was, uh, yeah, it went, it went fairly, fairly bonkers on Twitter. Um, but I still wasn't quite happy because on all the times, the bird was sort of slightly facing away from me and I thought, you know, I'm sure I must be able to do better and get it get it slightly more square on. Um, so I put another 10 days effort into it, going back down, and you know, it, it, for one reason or another it didn't happen. And then this morning I went down and it was like perfect, perfect conditions. Um, again, the bird was on the wrong side of the path. Then it flew to the right side of the path. And then I managed to catch the wren's breath with the wren sort of fully, fully facing me. Um, but an amazing thing to see. Um, but I mean, I, I guess the, the one lesson I learned with this was it, it was a great project because it sort of, it, it got me over quite a difficult period of um, what happened with the dog. Um, but it was also the fact that I had I'd sort of seen it when the Wren's Breath situation wasn't actually happening. Um, but I sort of saw the potential for the photograph, if that makes sense. Um, and then I put the effort in to to actually get get that actual photograph. So it was a really good sort of project to get from um, seeing the concept to getting the photographs. If that if, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, camera equipment I used for this one. I, I was using the Canon R five, um, and I was I was actually using an eight hundred mil, the Canon eight hundred mil lens. Uh, but I, I didn't need to use a Canon eight hundred mil. Um, I could have done it with. A lot shorter focal length than that but because I've got one I wanted to use that just to sort of minimize my chance of disturbing the bird um, I mean if you think of it in terms of you know it took me three weeks to get the first set of Wren's breath images um, you've only got a very small window of opportunity to capture these shots and obviously if I'd spooked the bird and it, and it moved away then I've sort of ruined that chance so I used the longest lens I've got so I was the furthest away from the bird. And, and, and I mean, I guess that rule stands for, for much wildlife photography as well. Um, you really, you know, often you want to use the longest lens that you have because you want to minimise your chance of scaring the subject. Um, and I don't want people all thinking, oh, you know, he's photoshopped it. So I did um, manage to also sort of capture a, a very small segment of video on it, on it as well. Um, so 
you, you can see there how fast the actual breath comes out of the bird as well. Um, it, I think it's amazing to see as it as it's actually singing, and you see that breath sort of form out. Um, yeah, it was I, for me. I think it was probably my. I've, I've, I've started with some of my best work, um, and it was you know that it was it was a very good, great project to work on. I think the other thing with it as well is you know a wren is a very common bird um, you know we we see wrens all the time i occasionally get them in my garden but you know you can take a you can take a common bird um, and make really dramatic photographs of it it just if you manage to get it in a totally different situation uh Kim, what sort of shutter speed did you use that is a very good question i think i used about a thousandth of a second um, because like, I don't know if you just noticed in the video, when when the breath was coming out there, it was super fast. In fact, just bear with me. I will tell you exactly, because I'll bring it up on my other computer. There it is. So, settings, I had, actually I shot it at one, two, uh, one two and a half thousand for the second um, and yeah, it, it's, it's a really good question because I, I also shot it wide open at f5.6 and I also shot it at ISO 3200 um, and it is worth so because this is a really good point this often I find with wildlife photography uh, shutter speed is the absolute key and on something like that, where the breath is moving so fast, you know, you're going to need a really um, fast shutter speed to capture that. You don't want that that breath to be uh, you having too slow a shutter speed that it's not freezing that breath. So I've compromised on the on the other side. You know, I, you know ideally you don't want to be shooting at ISO three thousand two hundred. Um, but if I hadn't got the breath sharp, um, I don't think the shots would have worked. So you know, I accept that there's going to be a tiny little bit of noise. Um, and shoot at ISO 3200. So, good question. So, uh, for me, uh, you know, there's the sort of two um, different types of wildlife photography in, in my view. Um, there's what I call sort of stumbled upon photography, and there's planned photography. So, in the planned photography here, uh, I'm actually at a friend's hide, um, kingfisher fishing. You know, you go in, you've got a target species. You know what type of shot you, you're taking, you've thought about it, etc. And then you can have stumbled upon photography as well. So um, oh, this picture I took <laughs> of the four kingfishers together, I took many, many years ago. It was actually my first ever published picture. Um, and I was out walking the dog. Um, and I, I'm looking if I've got a site called Fairbiddings, an RSPB site, which is just down the road. And I'd taken the dog for a walk uh, it's, it's probably it's maybe 11 years 12 years old this picture um, and I'd walked past the spot where you can sometimes see kingfishers and there's a screen there and it sort of stuck my head through and didn't see anything me and the dog continued walking up and then we were walking back and there was a guy stood behind the uh, the kingfisher screen and he's it's somebody I knew and he was waving at me and he, and he, was, he had four fingers up like this I'm thinking what's he on about and I walked, walked down to the kingfisher screen, looked through, and there's four kingfishers just sat together. Um, luckily, I had a longish lens with me as well, which I, I often used to take out on the dog walk. Uh, but yeah, so it, it, yeah, it's, it was one of my best sort of wildlife moments at the time, seeing four kingfishers together. Um, but it was a complete sort of stumbled upon sort of chance piece of photography. Um, so the situation there as to why there's four kingfishers the one um, second from the left, that's an adult male, and the other three are uh, fledglings, you know, sort of young, young kingfishers. And there, there actually was five kingfishers there. There was the adult female as well, but she was more in the reeds to the right. You can't, you couldn't get her in the picture. Um, and basically, um, mum and dad take their babies out to, um, to, to teach them how to fish. And, and then after a couple of days, they chase them off. So it's... It, it's quite a rare event to see to see them like this. But yeah, and we're going to sort of stick with this theme though of sort of stumbled upon and planned because I think it, I think it's quite important really. And yeah, it, it's great to have stumbled upon moments. Um, and you know, there are other times when you have to do the planned stuff as well. So the um, 
you had the Wren's breath stuff that we've just been through, um, you know, that was that was totally planned. Um, so what do I sort of take out with me? So for sort of stumble upon days, um, which is, you know, just me going for a walk around a sort of a nature area and you know, I'll, I'll take a full frame camera with me, which is currently the R5. Um, I was using the um, Canon 5D Mark IV before that. Um, and I tend to have in my bag for this, so it's sort of like a general bag. I'll have the uh, Canon EF 100-400 uh, uh, version 2. Um, ignore the word macro there, I've done a typo. Um, and then... Oh, have we just lost the video? Looks like we may have lost the video. Well, that's really weird. Oh, right. Well, I'm glad that's working there um, on this. Ah, apologies, everybody. Uh, I thought we had uh, we, we had lost the video. It looked like it had on mine. So let me go back on here. So uh, yeah, <laughs> apologies. So yeah, I have the hundred to four hundred mil lens with me, and then I also take my hundred mil macro lens with me as well because that's a great all round lens. Um, I'll have some comfortable clothes for walking. Um, and I'll also have a good set of binoculars with me because I'm trying to sort of spot things. And I will have a, this is, this is more of a recent thing. I, because if, if I went out and I'm doing photography, especially when I'm doing macro stuff, a lot of the time I'll be um, kneeling down on the floor, etc., or, or sitting down in wet grass. I take a little three-legged stool with me now as well. And that does make life uh, so much easier for me because before I'd, I'd be out and I'd be, I'd be kneeling down for, um, yeah, and I could be kneeling down for half an hour if I found an interesting macro subject. And then I'd get up and my knees would be aching, my me, me left ankle, the one that I'd bust in that climbing accident, that would be aching. Now I just take this little uh, three legged stool, which cost me about uh, just a couple of pounds. And it's absolutely brilliant. So if you if you do get into that type of photography, I would just invest a few pounds in it. It's it's only about this big as well. So if I sit down on it, and it and it's really good for. Oh, we're going to go into some adder photographs later on. You know, something like that where you don't want to be moving around because you're going to spook your subjects. This little three-legged stool, you can sit down really easily. Um, for uh, for planned photo, it does become very specific because you know you have a specific um, subject in mind. Um, and it could require a different camera, uh, you know, I've, either a faster camera like a 1DX or larger files like the 5DS, although not so much now because the Canon R5 is both lightning fast and produces really large files. Um, but certainly uh, a couple of years ago when I was using the 5D Mark IV, if I needed a... Uh, if I needed fast shutter speeds, I, 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 would, I would get hold of a, you know, a, a 1DX camera. Um, and lenses it definitely gets more specific, you know, like I said, I might be using the 800mm because that's the longest one, or I might be using the MP 65mm as well. Um, and again, comfortable clothes, um, but this time it's more comfortable clothes for waiting, um, because if it's a planned shoot, um, you are, you know, you're, you're going and uh, you could be waiting there for four hours, eight hours, whichever. So rather than so much wearing comfortable clothes for walking, like I do when I'm sort of having a stumble upon day, I'll be wearing comfortable clothes for waiting, you know, especially, especially if it's cold. Um, and, and for either of these as well, um, I mean, I have a pair of shorts on at the moment because I'm in the house, but if I am going out to do wildlife photography or macro photography, I never wear shorts these days. And the reason for that is for ticks. Um, yeah, you, you, you really do not want to get bitten by ticks. Um, a lot of the sort of target subjects we're going to be talking about as well, Northwest Scotland um, is where I do a lot of that photography and I always, always wear trousers up there because there's a lot of ticks about and you don't want to pick up any of the diseases that ticks carry. Um, so old stumble upon moments, obviously we've got that one there with the, uh, the four kingfishers. 
But you know, stumble upon moments um, can be you know can be fantastic, um, and you know, it, it, common species can provide some unique opportunities. So here I was, um, um, I'd actually gone to a site looking for uh, bearded tits. Um, didn't find any bearded tits. It took me years to get filming photographs of bearded tits. And as I was walking back towards the car, I, there was some bird feeding. As bird feeders, I was looking along, and yeah, there was just some mallards around there, and. And then I saw this big brown rat come out, um, and I saw the sort of I thought, is that mallard going to uh, interact with that rat? I thought, what's going on there? And the, obviously, the rat was just picking up bits of bird food that had um, that had fallen down from the bird feeders. And uh, luckily, I fired a burst just at the right time, and this mallard whacks this rat, uh, flicks it up into the air. It was like the most uh, bizarre. Uh, Thing I've ever seen, and then and then they were like friends again. So I mean, I assumed that if uh, you know a mallard whacking a rat and flicking it up into the air, that the uh, the rat would uh, would run off for cover, full stop. But no, it didn't. And this this was another great stumble upon moment. And this is this is one to look out for later in the summer when the uh, the farmers start ploughing fields. So if you have um, if you have red a decent population of red kites near you, it turns out red kites love following tractors when they're ploughing fields. I mean, red kites are a brilliant target species in the uh, in the UK. Yeah, and it's fantastic that they've done such a good comeback. Um, so yeah, and the reason that red kites um, like to do this is that they're, they're after worms basically. So after the farmer has turned the soil, that makes it really easy for the red kites to spot worms. And uh, yeah, this this was a stumble upon moment um, where I, I was just I was driving back from somewhere, um, as I went past this field, I was like, "Is that loads of red kites are flying around in the sky?" Um, and and it was yes. Yeah, so I just pulled the car over and got this sequence of. Um, Red kites pulling up worms. I didn't even know that red kites ate worms. Um, yeah, it was quite funny to see them pulling pulling the worms out of the soil. And this this was a, another sort of stumble upon moment. And these ones are years old. These photographs. Um, I'd actually sort of gone to a place to. Um, to try and photograph kingfishers, and then all of a sudden these black-headed gulls started coming down and splashing down in the water. Uh, but it was like one of those perfect sort of still, still mornings with a sort of really strange light, which gave me these uh, bizarre reflections. But again, just stumble upon moments. Going, I mean, these these photographs must be about ten years old as well. But the, the most important thing I find with with wildlife photography is yeah, is finding your subjects. You know, no subjects means no photography. And the most other important thing is once you have found the subject, is not spooking your subjects. Because obviously if you spook them, they're going to disappear. Um, sometimes they may disappear forever. I mean, I'll, I'll get onto that one shortly with uh, one of my favourite subjects to photograph. Um, so, you know, how do you find subjects? Um, one of the things I found, um, but this did take some time, is sort of befriending local experts. Um, you know... Probably my expert subject is macro photography, um, you know, but I have a lot of friends who sort of specialise in owl photography, kingfisher photography, etc. And once, you know, you've gained their trust and they know that you're, you know, you photograph ethically and you try not to spook things, etc. And you've sort of learnt the field craft, you know, you, you, I've, I've found people will tell me where things are, but you do have to gain that trust. Um, the use of social media, um, back in the day, Flickr, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Um, this um, this owl here, um, this young tawny owl, um, this 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 I sort of saw on Twitter because um, there's a site. Uh, it's it's a reasonable drive for me. It's about an hour away. Um, Top Hill Low, really really good site, and I follow them on Twitter. And I remember one Saturday morning looking at my phone on Twitter, and Top Hill Low sort of said. If anybody wants to see a branched out um, tawny owl, uh, come over to our site. There's there's, there's one in the car park, um, and I don't know if you know with tawny owls when the um, the tawny owls uh, the young tawny owls get to a certain age, the parents take them out of the nest and they stick them on a branch, generally pretty high up in a tree. And this one was really high up in the tree, um, and they just leave them there for the day. And it's just the tawny owl adults getting the youngsters ready for when they when they have to leave the nest. Um, so you know, social media can be great there, and I, I wouldn't have got these shots if it wasn't for me following Top Hill Low on Twitter. 
Um, and learn your subjects as well. I mean, this one I can't state enough. Um, you know, which birds make certain calls. Um, I mean, some of my friends, uh, their um, their knowledge on bird calls is is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, we're going to get to woodpeckers in a bit, and uh, now is a really good time for photographing woodpeckers at the nests because the uh, they've had the young, the young are inside the tree, um, and they're really easy to hear. So if you're walking around the woodland and you hear this sort of noise coming out of a tree, you know, have a good look, get your binoculars out. Uh, wait, see if a woodpecker flies back, and see if you can locate where the nest is. Um, but those, you know, learning those calls or the noises that certain animals make is 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 really key. And you know, get to understand their behaviour. Um, again, we, we'll cover woodpeckers when we get there. But if you stand by the woodpecker nest with your camera out, the parent won't actually come back to the nest. So you know, you you've got to learn the behaviour. Um, explore local patches a lot. Um, this one has definitely been amplified this year. Uh, yeah, previous years, I've known of one barn owl um, uh, near me. This year, because I've been doing so much more locally, I've found four barn owls within about two miles of my house now. Um, you know, I, I live at the edge of a town. It's not like I'm living in in, in a totally rural area. You know, there, there, there's lots of wildlife out there. So the more time you spend on local patches, um, the less driving you're doing, the more looking you're doing, and the more photography you're doing. So I, I've, I've, I've come to love local patches a, a lot more than I used to do. And understand the seasons and the weather. You know, we're coming into summer now, um, and we're mostly going to be talking about summer species. You know, use paid for services as well. You know, some of my work that I'm going to show here has been for on, um, yeah, totally out in the wild. Um, I think if we get to cuckoos and kingfisher, some of that's been done in sort of specialised hides. Um, so they can be really good ways of you know, finding subjects. And you know, the key is just spending a lot of time. You know, wildlife photography, the more time you invest into it, the more you're going to find, the more stumble upons you're going to have, the more you're going to get ideas for uh, the planned photography as well. And, and you know, learning patience. I'm... I quite often people get on social media saying, oh, you know, you must have the patience of a saint. And I'm like, I really don't. I've really had to learn to be patient. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible for being impatient. And yeah, th this, this sort of, this tale of otters sort of sums it up really. Um, I remember uh, maybe, I was still working for Morrison Supermarket, so I bet it would have been 2012. And I really wanted to photograph otters, um, and a lot of people had said to me, "Oh, well, you know, you, you want to go to you want to go to the Isle of Mull. You know, you, there's so many otters on the Isle of Mull." So I did. Um, I think I was going up. Well, my idea was was to go to Mull, photograph otters, and then drive to another part of Scotland either to look for pine martins or dolphins, wh wh whichever. So. I was sort of thinking, oh, you know, well, I'll book a couple of days in this B and B, and I'll, I'll have found some otters by then. And I, I, I spoke to one guy in Tobermory, and he's like, oh, well, you could try exploring this area and this area. So I stopped in this B and B, and I explored and I explored and I walked and I walked, and I did not see any otters whatsoever. Um, I then went on the uh, Mull Charters boat um, and met those guys, and they were like, oh, well, you could try. Um, you could try this site and this site. So I was like, oh, okay. And they were like, yeah, go, go, go down to Craig Neal campsite. There's sort of things to be otters down that way at the moment. So I went to Craig Neal campsite. So by now I've actually extended my trip. I just thought I'm just going to spend the the, the the full trip here because it's uh, I might as well. And then, yeah, I think the first morning outside my tent, um, when I got up after coffee, I found this, this dog otter. So I'm like, so I'm a week in now, but I finally sort of found my first otter. Um, and then the following morning was my was was my last day and I saw two otters out together. So this would have been about uh, five o'clock in the morning, uh, 5.30, something like that. Two otters together and uh, one of them brought this big fish in. Um, he's then swam off and then the other one brought this sort of flatfish in. Uh, brilliant experience. Um, but yeah, it took me it took me a sort of full week really, and what I hadn't got was that local knowledge, and that 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 local knowledge could have you know could have got me to finding those otters so much quicker. And since then, I've I've spent loads of time on mull, um, and you know got to photograph various different otter families.
Okay, how are we doing for time? 10.32, crikey, I'm talking too much. Let's, uh, I'll go through these quite quickly. So the, these are just uh, different otters over different different years. Um, but I really, really do love photographing otters. But yeah, I mean, you have to be really careful photographing otters. Um, yeah, this picture here, um, they see me and off they go. So what I would say is if you, you know, you want to go out and try photographing otters, you know, under no, you know, if you see an otter on the shore, do not try and approach it. Um, you know, if you try and approach an otter, it's just gonna, it's just gonna go. Um, the, the trick is, you know, is, is to watch them swimming in the sea. Um, and then if they start coming into shore, try to get behind some rocks or something. Um, you know, don't, if you're photographing otters, you don't wanna be, you don't wanna be stood up with your camera you know, you need to be you need to be down on the floor, either laid down or you know, um, you, you've got to be you've got to be so so careful because they they have you know they're super sensitive. They've got fantastic hearing. Um, you know, if you're um, if you're upwind from them and they get to smell you again, they're going to be gone. But you know, if you um, if you take your time, um, they are fantastic to photograph. In fact, they, so this otter here. Um, I photographed just oh, about four weeks ago. I'd done a trip up to Mull. Um, this was morning number one, so my uh, success rate had got a lot better. Um, and I'd actually been, <clears throat> I'd, I'd walked down, I'd got up really early, had a coffee, walked down uh, part of the coastline, um, didn't, didn't see anything. And then I looked back the direction I'd walked and in the distance I could see an otter. So um, with my binoculars to see this uh, this otter swimming around, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll walk back up that way. And when I got there, I, I still I couldn't see it, um, and I've been out for some time now. So I thought, right, I better um, I better get back to the tent and have another coffee. So I start walking back to the tent, and I just walk around the uh, around this sort of protometry of rocks, and there's this otter. And it's swimming straight towards me, and it's only about ten meters away. So I'm like, oh, God, I haven't got time to do anything. So I just sort of put myself put myself backwards onto the floor, and then I'm sort of on top of my camera bag. So I had to try try and fiddle the camera out my camera bag. Uh, I was laid, laid laid down facing this otter who's come on the shore now with this crab, um, and he's munching munching this crab in front of me. I had to sort of balance the camera on my knee. And, uh, and photograph it but uh, you know I didn't move uh, photograph the otter he did he did know I was there though but he, uh, because I didn't move towards him he he, he, he was not bothered um, so he munched his crab and, um, and off he went and then this was um, this was a pair of otters that I found on the on the same trip again you know they were they were pretty easy to photograph as, as long as you didn't approach them that's it's a mum and a cub so while we're still up in Scotland, I thought I would shoot us over to some uh, some other species. So uh, puffins, um, this is a great species to start photographing this time of year. Um, and you know we've got puffins. Um, you know we've got a couple of good locations for puffins up and down the country. Um, so you've got Scomer Island, um, sort of further south. Um, you've got the Farne Islands, Bempton Cliffs. Um, these ones were actually on um, on Lunga Island, um, near Mull itself again. Uh, but puffins, absolutely uh, fantastic species to photograph. Um, so photogenic, such a beautiful looking bird. Um, I have not ever nailed the uh, puffin with a mouthful of um, a mouthful of eels yet. Um, I've no doubt some of you have, have probably photographed that, but yeah, that's that's been a, a bogey shot of mine. I'm hoping now with the R5, it will be uh, it will be easier to do. Um, but yeah, those, those puffins don't are flying fast. Um, and you know, if you're up that way, another target species has to be um, has to be the white-tailed eagle. Um, I mean, if you go out with more charters, not only do you have a chance, a very good chance of seeing uh, white-tailed eagles, well, almost sort of like 99%, um, but there's, yeah, there's fantastic views from the boats as well, the dolphins up there, potentially. Um, but yeah, white-tailed eagles, they are such a joy to photograph. These ones were just from the other week. I, I mean, if I'm photographing white-tailed eagles, I tend to use the... Um, I use the 100 to 400 because the, if, if you're going out on the boat, the um, those birds do come pretty close to the boat, and it's sort of it's good to have that flexibility of, of, of a zoom. Um, but I can never get with uh, white-tailed eagles the fact that all the corvids and the seagulls just manage to harass them so much. It,
but yeah such a beautiful bird these again were just taken just a couple of weeks ago these these last ones and i can definitely confirm that photographing these with an R Canon R5 is 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 much easier. The uh, the first one I showed there was when I um, the one at the beginning of the Otter story was um, that was from that first trip to Scotland, and I was using a Canon 1D Mark IV I think at the time, and I, I went on the boat twice, and I got sort of one decent-ish um, bird diving shot. This time on the R5, I did one trip on the boat and just ended up with with stacks of them. It uh, makes it definitely makes it much easier. And of course, I, it would be a bit remiss of me. I know we're more talking general wildlife, but not to mention that now is just an amazing time for macro. Um, you know, macro seasons in well, it's just about in full swing. We're just going from that transition now, from sort of spring species to summer species. So. There's going to be a lot more butterflies emerging over the next few days. Um, but a key a key one to look out for, for me, is dragonflies emerging. If you can find a dragonfly emerging, um, it's yeah such a fantastic thing to photograph. So here we've got, um, I think it's a common darter um, coming out of its exuvia. And this was a couple of years ago. I mean, it looks like, um, it looks like alien. Um, but... Yeah, if you can if you can find one of these exuvias and sort of photograph the sort of full sequence of the um, of the dragonfly coming out of the exuvia, it is a it's a thing to see. Um, but if you do find it, you've got to be you've got to be really careful that you don't. This, this is the dragonfly's most sort of delicate stage. Um, you know, if you were to disturb this dragonfly and it was to drop off the stem, it's gonna it's gonna Rock, it's going to ruin the dragonfly basically because its body is really really soft it's not pumped its wings up yet its wings haven't hardened it has to do this and then and then once it's uh, once it's done this it hangs its wings out to dry if i can get to the next slide well it's not that there, there. it hangs its wings out to slot uh, to dry and then the dragonfly is ready for flight So now is a yeah, good time for spiders as well. Apologies if anybody doesn't like spiders. Uh, these ones, actually, you know, I didn't have to go very far for these ones. These ones are on my garden fence. Um, but again, because it was super local, it gave me um, it gave me opportunities to sort of try try to really sort of push the pictures of the spiders. So here I've got um, a, a seven times magnification portrait of a, of a wolf spider on my garden fence. I don't know if you can see the uh, the house in the spider's eyes, uh, but that's actually my house reflected in the spider's eyes. So I, I was using the um, the Canon MPE 65 here and a full set of extension tubes to get me right up to seven times magnification. But you know, now is a good time for spiders. And in about a month's time, um, that same species here. So when I photographed these, there were spiderlings. So these were spiders from last year. So a little bit later on in the summer, uh, probably from about a month's time. Um, so this is a female wolf spider. I don't, I don't know if you can see, um, she has a whole load of spiderlings on her back. So she, at the moment, if you see wolf spiders, they've got like a little egg sack with them, um, which they're carrying sort of, uh, sort of behind and underneath her abdomen. But once that egg sac splits and the little spiderlings come out, they all jump on her back. So it's just a, sort of done a crop there, just so you can sort of see it in more detail. So there she is with about 30, 30 different spiders on her back. And again, that's, for me, that's, um, it's sort of one in my calendar. So come July time, that's when this generally starts happening. And I'll be really looking around for wolf spiders and seeing if they've got, uh, got the spiderlings on the backs. And then just now, though, is a fantastic time. So these these images I'm just going to show you now quite quickly. These macro shots are all just from the last week and a half. So one thing that I look for on the weather forecasts is I'm looking for days when it's been warm and it's got quite humid and then nights when it's quite cool. Um, and then what I'm basically looking for is the right conditions. So the temperature hits what's called a dew point and the moisture, which is in the air, 
then sort of collects dew on, on grasses and the insects. So when the weather forecast looks like that, I have my phone currently set for 3.30, and um, that's the tough bit. And then I will get up, stick my head out the window, and if I can see condensation on the front of the car, it's downstairs, quick coffee. Um, and the, I guess these are probably planned shoots because I'm going with a specific target species in mind and I do change what's in my camera bag. So I'm going out very much with a sort of macro camera bag for when I'm photographing these. Um, but yeah, this last week and a half has been has been amazing for macro photography. So this is a Namada B. Um, I, I, I photographed this last week. It's only the second one I've ever found in the UK. Um, again, it's, it's completely covered in condensation and they use their jaws um, to pincer on a blade of grass and that's how they, they roost for the evening. Uh, banded demoseals. Um, these banded demoseals have just emerged um, and I, we've got quite a lot of damselflies which have emerged but there's still quite a lot of species which are yet to come out so it's things like um, emerald damselflies for example that they're, they're not out yet but they will be they will be out in a couple of weeks and it's a seal and then yeah this this was the most dew I have ever seen on a on a damselfly just just last week but you, you can see what the dew does to the images um, where you've got the uh, compound nature of the eye etc refracting in the dew drops um, you can see you can sort of see the grass from behind um, but when you find in if you go out and do this type of photography and this is why my alarm is set for 330 you have a very limited timeline because you know, the, 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 the insects are covered in dew um, but as soon as they start getting enough heat from the sun they they will wake up they will sort of try taking the dew off themselves and basically they're just preparing themselves for flight. Now, if this happened before, when if I was out photographing insects early on the morning and they woke up and they started moving, I, I was like, all right, well, you know, I can't really do any more photography now. But of course now, what all I do is I stick the uh, the camera into movie mode and uh, record a movie. So this is um, this damselfly is taken with the MPE 65 last week um, at about three times magnification. He's like a he's like a little um He's like a little composer when he puts his arms out like this. But yeah, I've, I've really got into doing these movie clips now. Um, just in sort of in terms of sort of settings and doing this type of thing as well. Um, so I, I do use very different settings when I'm doing the movies. So if I'm doing regular macro photography, I'll sort of try and reduce the ISO a little bit and, you know, I'll be aiming for around a hundredth of a second, uh, whatever I can get away with, and, and often those shots are stacked as well, um, which obviously I can't stack, um, you can't stack in, in videography. So what I will end up doing if I'm doing a video is I'll shoot the ISO all the way up to ISO 6400, and just, you know, noise doesn't seem to matter so much when you're doing video, but obviously because I'm shooting at high magnification and I'm very close to the subject, the depth of field is tiny. So I'll shoot the ISO right up and that allows me to use a, a, a narrower aperture and increase my depth of field. And then, yeah, this was this was just the other morning because yeah, if, if you, all the wild flowers are out at the moment. So this photograph I've, of a band of Demoseal, I photographed and there was a big bank of wild flowers behind and yeah, obviously I've got the uh, the sunrise in there. And this this I photographed last week, which is a uh, um, yeah one of our unfortunate um, consequences of going out and doing photography in summer. So this is a mosquito, um, and this is a five times magnification shot of a mosquito's head. So you can you can see the bit that the mosquito uses to uh, bury into your flesh and uh, give you a, a mosquito bite. And then yeah, this last of the macro images. I had to include some, and this this one I photographed on Tuesday, um, which goes completely away from all of the normal sort of settings and ways I do macro photography. So this one's a single shot, um, 
And when I found this damselfly, um, the sun hadn't risen, and it was actually sort of half buried in the flower, um, and it wouldn't have made an interesting photograph at all. So I was like, yeah, well, I'm not even going to bother trying to photograph that damselfly because it's just like half a damselfly stuck out of the flower. And then I walked for about half a mile down this banking, and I was really struggling to find any other photographic subject. So um, the sun, the sun had risen, and I thought I've only got a limited amount of time now because the, you know, everything's going to start being active. And I'm like, oh, and it's been a really dewy morning. I was anyway. As I started started walking back, I went back to where that damselfly was, and um, and it had actually come out of the flower and it had gone on top of the flower and it was start, starting to be active. And then I saw where the sun was. And I thought, ah, oh, God, if I get the camera really low and sort of point slightly upwards, I'm going to better get it with the sun behind, maybe. Um, and because the damselfly had got active, I thought, well, I'm going to shoot this. I'm going to try shooting this at about F8. But at F8, the sun was more in focus and it was too small for the shot that I wanted, which was the damselfly cut sort of completely surrounded by the sun. So I ended up having to shoot at f2.8. Um, so that made the sun bigger, but then everything was just way too bright. So I had to bring the ISO down to ISO 50, um, and then I had to shoot it at 8,000 for the second. It's, it's the most bizarre settings I have ever used for a, for a macro photograph. So we're going to move away. Well, we're semi going to move away from macro. I'm going to cover lizards. God, it's 1048. I have I've made this talk too long. So I'm going to go through lizards really quickly. Um, now is a very good time for photographing lizards. You know, if you want to photograph lizards, you want to find uh, you find them on rocks and walls and old dead trees. That you know, they're, they're all good things to look for. Um, you know, that they they, they they tend to be out basking in the sun. Um, these lizards were. Um, uh, one of my favourite reserves, and I found three lizards living in this crack in the wall. Um, they have now sort of dispersed. I'm not seeing them at that site anymore. But normally with lizards, you have to be super, super slow with them. Um, they're really, really skittish. Yeah, I'd generally be using like the 100 to 400 mil lens, um, at 400 mil, maybe with an extension tube. Um, but you know a tiny bit of movement and they're gone now with these guys I don't know if it was because I just spent so much time with them or whether it was because they were in this crack in the wall But they were just absolutely not plussed at all. So to start with I was using my 400 mil um, And then I'm, I'm on my little three-legged stool as well And then I'm like well actually they're just they're just they're not ever moving So I actually then started photographing them with my 100 mil macro um, and again, they still didn't move. So I, I actually, so this is actually a, a five times magnification shot with the um, the Canon MPE. Uh, and I mean, in the Canon MPE at five times magnification, my working distance is forty one millimeters. So it, it it hits about that. So that shows how close I was to uh, this common lizard, and it still didn't move. Um, but yeah, absolutely good, a really sort of fun species to uh, photograph. And, and here, I mean, I've got a crop which goes a bit wrong, but it shows what I was trying to do. I don't know if you can see in the lizard's eye there, you can, you can A, tell it's in a crack in the wall, um, and B, you can, um, you can see my lens, but you can also see me. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever got a selfie reflection in a common lizard's eye, which was, uh, yeah, I didn't think I would be getting that. Right, snakes, let me see, 1050. Um, so snakes are absolute sort of favourite species of mine to photograph. Now, now actually isn't a good time to photograph them because uh, they, it, it's too hot. Um, the best times really for photographing snakes, I know we're sort of going to be talking about summer, but the best time is sort of late March, early April, or autumn time when it starts getting cooler again. Um, this is quite a rare shot of mine. Uh, again, very, very old. Um, and it's both an adder and a grass snake together. Unfortunately, neither snake is facing me. Um, but I have spent a lot of time photographing snakes. So this is um, this is grass snakes, which have um, which have just come out of hibernation. Um, these I photographed with a very long lens because they've just come out of hibernation. Um, you know, you do not want to disturb them. So all of my snake photography has pretty much been done with long lenses. Um, other than if I if, if I found one which has been really really docile, so this is um, grass snakes breeding. So the larger one is is the female, um, and you've got a small male there as well. That was them breeding again. 
again, these are photographed with a very long lens. Um, I, I saw the snake sort of come together and they started mating and I just stayed exactly where I was. Um, I watched them do their mating type thing and then they split off and both went their separate ways. The adder, um, another adder. Grass snakes. So I've actually started doing stacking photography um, with snakes as well to try and get more detail. So here with this grass snake, um, I've got both the head and the front scales in focus. And I, I've done that by just um, gently moving the camera in my hands towards the snake. Um, I was using I was using the Canon M5 actually on this this walk. I was sort of trying the M5 on the wildlife photography and what was so good about the mirrorless cameras is you can use the focus peaking to see which bits in focus so sort of just moving backwards and forwards till I could see those front scales in focus and then just sort of gently sort of move my hands towards a snake while firing a burst so it meant I ju it just meant I could get that much more detail on these front scales and the snake's eye um, without stacking you couldn't really do that another adder obviously this this one I found just um uh, it was just going across a, a walking track actually I, I waited with the adder for about half an hour just so nobody came down the walking track and accidentally stood on it and then this was me working on an adder project back in 2019 when i got back from sweden and this involved me um sitting on my little three-legged stool in this area um waiting for um uh, yeah i went a lot over a two-week period but the thing I was wanting to see, um, oops, that's that. No, that's grass snakes mating, which I saw while I was waiting for the other thing. So that's more grass snakes mating. And you can see there, again, you can sort of see the big female in the background, um, but she's actually got two males with her trying to, uh, trying to mate. That female snake is huge as well. This is what I was waiting to see. So I have been wanting to see this for years. So this is, this is two male adders. Um, doing their adder dance so what what's actually occurring here is at the bottom of the picture I don't know if you see there's there's another there's a female adder there and she's browner you can just sort of make her out and, and basically at that time of year the the female adder will exude a pheromone which brings the males in and while I was sat on my little three-legged stool in this area I would actually have the male adders go right past my feet um, but they're not bothered about me they're just they're just after finding the female and if two male adders come together while this is happening they'll do this they'll do this battle basically trying to push each other down so i'd i'd gone to this site quite a few times over this period and then i finally saw this and then bizarrely 30 minutes later i saw it again about 20 meters away so i ended up seeing two adder dancers in one day but if you do go to photograph this just be aware it is so so quick i i was assuming they'd be doing this like graceful type thing but it's not it's it is it is very rapid um i got lots of shots and i only got a couple of shots that are in focus uh, it's and obviously they're not doing it in a nice open environment um you know they're doing it in um they're doing it through dense foliage etc so it was it was a really challenging thing to photograph but snakes Fantastic subject to photograph, but we have to be so, so careful with snakes and not applying too much pressure on them. Um, so this site here, um, I photographed in, um, it was April 2019. And then, oh, sorry, April 2020, I, you know, we were in strict long lockdown. So I, you know, I didn't go to this site. Um, but then April this year, I could go and I've been I've been going back to the site since March, and this the, the site is huge, um, and it's generally very quiet. It's not somewhere that that many people go normally, but because everything was locked down, but you could go hiking, the site had been under massive pressure um, from walkers. Um, well, not not so much walkers, but you know just families going out and enjoying themselves. So there has been people walking all over the reserve, and I put a couple of weeks. Um, in, and looking for adders in that site and I've not seen a single one so you know this this wildlife is is very very sensitive so woodpeckers I, I mentioned earlier on uh, woodpeckers this is now now is the best time for photographing woodpeckers because if you can find one of these woodpecker nests and like say 
they're probably one of the more distinctive bird noises to um I am not going to try and do a, a woodpecker young impression though, but they, they make this sort of like, meh, 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 meh. Oh, I've, I've just done it, haven't I? It, it, inside the tree. So if you're walking in an area where you, there's uh, any type of woods and you hear this sort of weird, insistent noise and you can't see the bird, then see if you can see a woodpecker hole. And then if you can, uh, back away. Again, this is why it's pretty essential when you're doing this type of stuff to have a good set of binoculars. Back right away from the trees and just start looking with your binoculars and see if you can see the uh, the woodpeckers coming in um, and then if, if you can time it right where the babies are then coming out of that hole and the parents are coming back with these big beaks full of insects um, it really is a fantastic thing to photograph um, now one thing I would say with these when I, I when I found my first active woodpecker nest um, I went along with um, with 500mm lens, can my old Canon, my old trusty Canon 500 f4, um, sort of got set up and I'm waiting, um, and I'm like, well, I'd waited about 20 minutes and I didn't see the woodpecker at all, and then I thought, hang on a minute, let me back up 50 metres, as soon as I backed up, woodpeckers coming in with grubs, so I quickly realised that you can't just stand by the tree and expect the birds to come in, so I completely adapted my approach, and what I'd do is I'd set the camera up, on a tripod, uh, put a radio controlled remote release on there. Um, I would then back away about well, as far as I needed to basically, um, sit there with binoculars and wait till I could see the adult and then as they, as they come flying in, then start firing the burst. Um, so if you do find one, that is what I would suggest you do. But fantastic things to photograph. Um, yeah, sort of wildlife in action. And, and now's the time to do it. So if you want to do this, you know, Get have a you know have a good look around some local woods and see if you can hear those um, woodpecker young. That's so cute though. <laughs> foxes, I've included foxes because obviously they're um, they're a, a, a great UK sub wildlife subject. I must confess, I have not really got many good pictures of foxes. I've not had that much luck. Um, these foxes here I found, um, this is actually a site I go to photograph marbled white butterflies. Marble white butterflies are going to be out very soon. Um, and I'd gone there one morning with the dog and I saw, I thought I, saw, I thought it was a hare to start with because it was quite some distance away and I thought there was a number of them. And then I only had my 100mm macro lens with me and I'd taken a picture and then when I, I zoomed into the picture, I'm like, oh, that, it's a fox. So I thought, well, maybe there was more than one fox. So anyway, I, I started going down there with a long lens. I could go at the bottom of this embankment. And I saw this single, uh, so this is like, um, this is a cub. Um, but this was in, was this August time? So, yeah, it's a cub. It's a fairly old cub. Um, I wish I'd found them. Um, I wish I'd found them a couple of months before. But every time I went down, I just saw one cub. So I, I was starting to doubt myself. And then... I went down there one morning, um, it always knew it was at the bottom of this hill as well, so it would always be looking down. I, w I went down this final morning, and there was the three, the three cubs, so I'm like, oh, brilliant. And I'm finally going to be able to sort of photograph sort of three fox cubs. Uh, here they are sort of running around, they were playing, um, sat there. And then I noticed the uh, fox cubs looking sort of further up the reserve, and I sort of followed the, look, the direction that the fox cubs were looking in. And then there's a great big herd of cows <laughs> moving down, and the fox cubs ran off. And I have a bit of a phobia of cows as well, so that was that was the, so that I, once I realised the farmer had put the uh, cows back in the field, I'm like, right, no, done with that project. Um, there's no cows in the field at the moment, but I've, I've had a look and I can't see any foxes either, uh, unfortunately. But you know, if, now is a good time for foxes and fox cubs. So most of the foxes will have had their cubs by now. Um, I have seen lots of pictures on social media of fox cubs in bluebells and what have you. I'm, I'm very jealous. I'm yet to uh, yet to get that type of result. So owls. Um, I'm gonna have to go through owls pretty quickly. And uh, that one's not a summer shot either because that's a short-eared owl and it's snowing. But now is a good time for owls and, and birds of prey. Um, not so much short-eared owls, but um, barn owls are, are showing very, very well right at this moment because they're generally um, they're generally feeding feeding young. 
so they're, they're having to hunt a lot more so it tends to mean they're hunting during the day um, that these barn owl shots here I, I just took last week like I say I've got a couple of local barn owls at the moment um, such a fantastic bird to photograph and and this one I mean yeah this photograph I took last Sunday a week today actually um, there's this beautiful wild flower meadow so I hope it keeps hunting during the day for, for a little bit longer but literally right now is the best time pretty much the best time of the year to be photographing barn owls um, and and tawny owls as well so this is um, another example of that one I showed you earlier so this young tawny owl had been branched out by its parents stuck on a branch um, and yeah unfortunately for the thing while it was stuck out on this branch it absolutely tipped it down and uh, you would have thought its parents would have been nice enough to, uh, to to stick it back in the nest but they didn't but it did provide for these fairly uh, unique photographs of the, the owl getting wet and then it's sort of stretching itself off in the sun I mean it looks more like some type of half owl half, half vulture there but yeah a great sequence and again so Little owl chicks now again is it is it, for a lot of the species we've been talking about now is the time to be photographing them. So the um, this was um, a fairly localish um, pair of um, little owl chicks, um, and again this is um, uh, an expert in South Yorkshire. He put me onto these little owls that were um, a little owl family that were in a graveyard, um, and he said to me, you know. Go down, I said, I completely trust you, Oliver. He said, but whatever you do, don't get out of your car. Just drive your car into the graveyard, zip your windows down. And he said, I, I, I'll guarantee you, he says, within, you know, you won't have to wait long for these little owls. And uh, and he was right. I was probably there only 10 minutes and they um, they appeared. And they basically, I, there was there was an adult little owl there, but that pretty much stayed in the trees. But these two chicks basically just hopped from tombstone to tombstone. Um, so were absolutely uh, very interesting to photograph and then I mean again these this is quite an old shot um, but both of the little owls came together and they landed on one tombstone and so bear in mind these little owls are just a couple of months old themselves and they landed on this tombstone and I didn't even read the tombstone until I got home but then I read it was you know it was a baby's tombstone and you've got baby little owls on there it still gives me um, goosebumps now does this photograph but again you know see if, you know, use your car as a hide. Yeah, you know, if I'd have got out of the car and tried photographing these owls, bump, you know, they, 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 they would have been gone. Uh, cuckoo, we are getting to the end of this now, so I, I won't overrun too much. Um, you know, cuckoos, again, now is a fantastic time to be photographing cuckoos. Um, they're over from Africa at the moment. The, uh, the males are trying to find females and mates, and then the female's going to be laying her eggs in other birds' nests. So, I mean, the, this, these pictures of a cuckoo were one up in the Yorkshire Dales, um, and this, this was, a, this was a, yeah, a very well-behaved cuckoo. I photographed it a few times. Um, great to see. And then, you know, your other option is, you know, there, there, are, there are a few hides out there now. So this one that's taken with, uh, with Mark Hughes, um, he's, he's set up a cuckoo hide. Um, and these ones were last year where we had to we had to take out I had to take my own hide because of um, coronavirus um, and I've got an, an old sort of tent hide in the um, um, in the garage and I hadn't used it for quite some years so I went up to um, where Mark is and um, we get up and he's absolutely tipping it down and I hadn't realized that there was a big hole in the hide so for four hours I sat there with water dripping down the back of my neck but it it was it was sort of worth it i think the rain added added quite a lot to the images on those so and you know obviously kingfishers kingfishers can be great to um can be great to photograph throughout the year um but again they're they're fledgling young where uh, maybe out soon so you know potentially you've got that chance of seeing um adult kingfishers with their fledglings um and I, I've done lots of kingfisher photography sort of off my own bat. These are again at, at Mark's place. Um, but fantastic birds to photograph. Um, I do love kingfishers. And it, this leads me to that, um, what I mentioned earlier. With the R5, it, you can do the focus bracketing now with the R5 and from a, a number of other mirrorless cameras as well. Um, and I, I sort of thought, I wonder if I can do... Um, 
I wonder if I could do focus bracketing with the Kingfisher so I could get like a stacked photograph of a Kingfisher in the same way that I do with my insect macro photography. And I'm thinking, well, with the R5, because it takes 20 shots in a second, um, you know, potentially I could use that focus bracket in and I could try and see if I could get a stack shot of a Kingfisher. Because with yeah, when you're photographing a Kingfisher like this and you're using a long lens and the bird is quite close to you, I've photographed them at F13 trying to get the whole bird in focus. And even at F13, you just can't do it. You can either have the back feathers in focus in this sort of classic pose or the eye in focus and you can't have both. So I thought, I wonder if they're doing it with focus bracketing. I wonder if that would work. And voila, it did. Um, what, what I basically did, I'm sort of sat in a hide, I've got the camera on a tripod, um, and when the bird had its back to me, because this, this was the composition I was after, um, I had the camera set up so I could touch on the screen and that would set the focus point. Um, and I've got the camera set up on the tripod with a remote release. I've programmed the camera to do focus bracketing. I think I told it to do 20 shots with the smallest increments. So I'm watching the bird, and again, it's all about that learning the behavior. And so it's bobbing around, and then it settles down. So I'm like, right, now's the time. So I just tapped on the back of the screen on, the, um, on where those back feathers are, basically at the point which is closest to me. As soon as I saw the camera had settled, after I tapped it, hit the remote release, the camera then just takes 20 shots using the focus mechanism in the lens moving through the um, moving through the bird and voila a stacked kingfisher um, now i'm not suggesting that everybody should start using sort of doing stacked photographs of birds because it's it, it's quite fiddly um, but i think there's definitely a sort of a time and a place so we have I've gone through mountains of material there, lots of different subjects and things to think about um, but i just wanted to sort of list out you know what what have been my own key lessons with photographing wildlife photography um you know and i'd say yes so think about the image you want to create um which sometimes mean a picture requires a full strategy you know the, the wren's breath is probably the best um, um example of that you know in terms of i thought about the image i wanted to create and i sort of saw that um without seeing it, if you see what I mean. I just saw the wren, but I sort of thought, wow, yeah, if I, if I managed to get all of those conditions together, and it just, you know, the strategy therefore then was deciding what equipment I was gonna use, but I was gonna use the longest lens I had, and it was just about putting the time in and getting there for lots and lots of early mornings. Um, yeah, another key thing I've learned is, you know, the, the composition is, is, is the most important element to a picture. Um, you know, after you've found the subjects, obviously you've got to find the, you've got to find the wildlife in the first place. But then, when you have found it, you know the composition is the sort of most important element to a picture, in in my view. Um, and the more you sort of develop your skills with photography, the better you can deal with a stumble upon moment. So you know if you don't want to bump into, you don't want to sort of walk around the corner see four kingfishers, and not worked out how to sort of focus on birds as such a, yeah so you know the more you develop those skills when something just happens in front of you and you have, have that stumble upon moment the better you are to the, the better you are prepared to be able to deal with it and you know absolutely a key point i've learned is you've got to be so sensitive to wildlife or it's going to run away um so you know the, the, you've got that instant problem there in the sense of that it's gone away but you know it might not come back uh, after there's been so much footfall on the other side I'm, I'm really worried that the other population there has, has gone but you know I'm just gonna have to wait and see um, you know and uh, this is something somebody told me many years ago but it's the one thing somebody has told me um, and it's stuck in my head and it's the one thing I think which has helped me develop my own photography and what they said to me was if, if you ever take a picture and you think it's a good shot um, don't just stop there. Look at that picture on the back of your camera and think, what could I do to make that picture better? And then whatever it is you could do to make that picture better, you know, try and do it and see if it did make that picture better. And then think on again, what could I do to make that picture better? And just this one person, it was David Clapp who told me, uh, he's a very good landscape photographer, he told me that. And it just resonated in my head and it doesn't matter whether it's landscape, wildlife, macro, astro, whatever. Um, I always do that now. It's definitely been one of my key lessons. Yeah, 
look at my picture, think what can I do to make that better and then do it. Um, I've also learned that time out in the field is much more valuable than time on the internet. Um, I know I'm telling you this over the internet, but I, I mean, more mean sort of like internet forums and, you know, time out in the field is just, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the thing we can do which increases our photography the most. And also, and I, mean, I mentioned this earlier when um, somebody asked about the, uh, what shutter speed did I use on the Ren's Breath? Um, shutter speed is often key over ISO and to a degree aperture. You know, with wildlife photography, it's nearly always about the shutter speed. Um, okay, over to you guys for um, for any questions. Sorry I have overrun by 12 minutes, um, but hopefully I have managed to um, give out any pointers. Um, because I was, uh, <laughs> because I, I sort of on, uh, in the zone on the presentation, I hadn't looked up that many of the questions as we were going through either. But so feel free to, um, um, yeah, I don't think I've missed any actually. Feel free to uh, ask any questions now. I will certainly hang around for a few minutes. Well, thank you, Camera World, for inviting me. And again, a, a big thanks to uh, Canon for uh, sort of sponsoring the event. Uh, great, Martin. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And hopefully, you know, people can take some of the things that we've spoken about today and start thinking about um, thinking about some of their own projects, etc. Well, I will hang about for um, for a couple of minutes for sure. Ah, oh, brilliant, Phil. Uh, by the way, because I've got two computers running, the one I've been talking to, and um, I've got my I've got a laptop just here to the left of me, so I'm not I'm not ignoring the camera. I'm just looking at the uh, looking at the questions come from. Oh, that's really good to hear, Peter. Thank you. Oh, cheers, Paul. That's great. Thank you, Janine. Yeah, Janine, I, I mean, I know I talked about um, uh, shutter being a priority, but um, just on that, I, 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 I nearly always shoot in manual for um, my photography. Nearly always, not not totally always, but um, but but nearly always. I, I, I'll, I will try and. Um, I just sort of manually set the exposure by looking at the exposure meter, but then thinking about the colour of the bird. So, for example, that, that barn owl I've just been photographing recently. If I if I just expose for um, in the middle like I normally would, um, it's tend it's going to tend to overexpose the barn owl. Um, but I'm nearly always shooting in um, in 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 in. in manual exposure mode for, for those but of course you know there are times when shutter priority is is good and when aperture priority is good as well and um, i just like yeah i just like to control everything if that makes sense oh thank you paul and pete great stuff Right, guys. Well, I think I will sort of wrap that up there. Um, if anybody has any more questions, um, you know, uh, feel free to you know ping me a message on social media or whatever. I will sort of try to check in on this talk later as well, just to see if there's any other ones come up. Uh, uh, cheers, Sean. Um, oh, crikey, you fractured your wrist. Oh, that could be a bit sore. I I broke this wrist many years ago, and uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's not nice. So I hope you uh, recover from that pretty quickly. Uh, right, guys. Right. Well, I will wrap that up there. Like I say, any more questions, you know, come come and find me on social media. Um, I'll ping back in here as well. So, yeah, massive thanks to uh, Camera World for in letting me come along. And, um, yeah, everybody, I hope you, uh, you hope you have a fantastic time for the rest of your Sunday. Cheers. Bye now.